Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Valley Christian Center's Adult Sunday School. In Ephesians 4, we read, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing truth that you have called together a people to be the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And Lord, I pray that as we study the application of this redemption that you have accomplished, that you would help each one of us to come to a greater understanding of your love and that we would love one another, Lord, as Christ loved us, so that the world would see in us the love of God, that the world would be drawn to Christ, that your church would be the radiant bride that Christ deserves, and that we would bring your gospel to the world that people may be saved. We ask your blessing on this time in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're ready to begin our study of the second part of Murray's book. So we have covered redemption accomplished, the necessity of the atonement and the nature of the atonement and the perfection and the extent of the atonement. And now we're ready to begin to look at redemption applied. And Murray begins by noting that God has generously provided for all of the needs of all of his creatures. In this case, all does mean all. He, he does not discriminate in the sense that he has provided for everyone, both those who are destined to be with him in heaven and those who are not. And Murray quoted from a portion of this passage in Psalm 104, he makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. So God has graciously provided abundantly above and beyond just our basic needs and has provided a great amount that is only for our pleasure. And so it is incumbent on all men to be giving thanks to God. Thanks for life and thanks for all of the provisions that God has made to make this life enjoyable in many ways. And most of all, we should be thanking him and unfortunately, this is one of the things that the unregenerate do not do and which brings God's condemnation upon them. But as God's people, we should be certain that we are filled with thanksgiving at all times and giving glory to God for all good things come from him. But because we are all by nature objects of God's wrath, our greatest need is not food and clothing and housing. Our greatest need is to be reconciled to God. And he has provided for that need as well in a way that, using the words of Murray, exhibits the overflowing abundance of God's goodness, wisdom, grace, and love. The superabundance appears in the eternal counsel of God respecting salvation. It appears in the historic accomplishment of redemption by the work of Christ once for all. And it appears in the application of redemption continuously and progressively till it reaches its consummation in the liberty of the glory of the children of God. What a wonderful statement of all that God has accomplished and done and is doing in his people. And the word superabundance there draws our attention immediately to thinking about Romans 5, where Paul writes, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Or you could say where sin abounded, grace superabounded. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we will first examine the sequence of events through which God applies the redemption that was accomplished by Christ to his chosen children. And this is called the order of application or the order of salvation, or again, theologians love the Latin, so they call it the ordo salutis. And so let's examine, before we go on to Murray, let's examine what the Westminster Shorter Catechism says about this because I think it's extremely instructive. 
So question 29 says, how are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? And the answer is we are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by his Holy Spirit. So we notice a couple of things. First of all, as we've noted before, redemption was accomplished by Christ. It is applied by the Holy Spirit. Of course, from beginning to end, it's the work of the entire triune God, but first and foremost, it's the Holy Spirit that applies redemption. And then question 30 says, how does the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? And the Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. So we see that faith is the means by which we are united to Christ and it is in union with Christ that we, that we receive the benefits of this and it comes about because of God's effectual calling. And then in what is effectual calling in question 31, and this is a marvelous answer, effectual calling is the work of God's spirit whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening us, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ and renewing our wills, he does persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. And it's really important to see all of the activity involved here. This is not some passive thing. God's Spirit convinces us of our sin and misery, He enlightens our minds, He renews our wills, and He persuades and enables us to embrace Jesus Christ, which means what? It means to believe, to come to faith, to a saving faith in God, in the work of Christ. And that is all because of a call that's offered to us in the Gospel. Somebody came and told us the Gospel of Christ. And then finally, question 32, what benefits do they that are effectually called partake of in this life? They that are effectually called do in this life partake of justification. That's being declared just in God's sight. It's a forensic declaration of God. Adoption, which means being adopted as children of God into the family of God. And sanctification, which means this continuing process of being made more and more holy until that glorious day when we die and were brought into God's presence, made perfect. What a wonderful thing. And the several benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from them. So there are other things that happen as well, and we'll get into some of those as we study the application of redemption. So Murray correctly points out that when we think of the application of redemption, we must not think of it as one simple and indivisible act. It comprises a series of acts and processes. And then he lists the order in which he places these things, and he puts effectual calling first, and then regeneration, faith and repentance together, we'll see why, justification, adoption, sanctification, perseverance, union with Christ, and of course ending with glorification. And we're going to take a look now at the biblical basis for this ordering of these things. There's a couple places in here where you could change the order, and it certainly would have no major impact on your theology, and Murray brings that out, but there are some other places where the order here is quite important to your theology. And so as we go through the application of redemption, we'll see that. And of course, the verse that most immediately pops into most people's mind when you think about the order of salvation is Romans 8.30, and it says, and those he predestined, he also called, those he called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. And I've put the order that Murray has these things in over here on the side of most of these slides so we can keep it in mind as we're going through them. So this presents, this passage presents calling, justification, and glorification, only those three, but in that order. And so the question comes up, did Paul intend that order to be significant or was he just listing these things and that happened to be the order in which they came to mind? And so we can look at that, and I think it's clear that he did have an order in mind, and he says more than just those three things. So what does the whole passage say? If you back up and look at Romans 8, 28 to 30, it reads, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we note that God's call here, Murray notes that it's according to his purpose, which clearly comes first and hints at order in the following sequence. It doesn't certainly say that for sure this sequence is being given in order, but it kind of hints at it. And it goes on, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And then we get to 830, and those he predestinated, he also called, and so on. 
So also notice that it says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. And foreknowledge clearly precedes predestination, and that doesn't matter on your, that doesn't depend on your theology. If you're a Reformed believer, that's true. And if you're a non-Reformed or Arminian believer, that's true. In either case, foreknowledge certainly precedes predestination. So order is indicated in those two as well. And then we go on and we note in Romans 30 itself, 8.30 itself, that predestination occurs in eternity past. This is something that occurred prior to creation and must, therefore, be prior to calling, justification, and glorification, which all occur in this world and in this life. So order is again indicated in that sequence. And then we notice, uh, here's how Murray puts it, we have a chain of events which find their spring in foreknowledge and their terminus in glorification. We cannot possibly reverse these two, so certainly the beginning and the end of this sequence is in the right, are in the right place. And so returning to just 30, we look at what it says with those he predestined he called, those he called he justified, those he justified he glorified, and Murray notes that glorification cannot possibly precede calling and justification, so order is again indicated. So that only leaves two elements in this entire list from this passage in Romans 8, which is calling and justification. So it would be very, very strange indeed if those were the only two that were out of order in this list. So at least it's perfectly reasonable to assume here that that Paul was listing an order for all of these things and that calling precedes justification. And so let's move on and see what else we can learn. We've looked at this verse before. John chapter 3 verses 3 and 5, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. So this establishes that new birth or regeneration certainly precedes entering the kingdom of God. We have to ask exactly what that means, but we are born, the idea here is that we are born into the kingdom of the air, as we'll see it's called in a minute, and we are under Satan's power and dominion, and then we are born again into the kingdom of God. So there's two kingdoms here. Every one of us was born into one of them naturally, And if we have been born again, we have been born again into the other kingdom. So let's take a look at what the scripture says here. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5 read, As for you, this is a marvelous passage, which we've looked at before and we'll look at again. But as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. So that's the kingdom we were in when we were born, and we were dead, as we've looked at before. You you don't come alive on your own. This isn't something you do. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's speaking, of course, of Satan. That's the kingdom of Satan. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. That's the characteristic of the kingdom we were in, those who are in that kingdom. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. There's our problem. There's man's huge problem. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. That's being brought into a new kingdom, as we'll see in a minute. It doesn't use that language here. But even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And if we move on and look at Colossians 1, 13 and 14, the Father has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Now, dominion means rule. So to be in the dominion of darkness means to be in the kingdom of darkness. It's the same thing as the kingdom of the air. It's the kingdom of Satan. And he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then in Revelation 11:15, 15, we're told the kingdom of the world, that's again the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the air, the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And that's again the kingdom of the Son. In the New Testament, it's most commonly called the kingdom of heaven, or even more commonly, the kingdom of God. So we see this idea of being translated from the kingdom we were in when we were born into the kingdom that you're in when you are born again. And so there's a sequence here. 1 John 3, 9 says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. There's a tremendous amount in that verse we won't get into right now. 
but it certainly establishes that regeneration precedes being delivered from the reigning power of sin, which is again this idea of being translated from one kingdom to the other. The people, remember we read the characterization of those who are in the kingdom of the air. Of the air. These are people who indulge in their sinful lusts. They do what they want to do. Which is again being, so I just said that, again being translated from one kingdom to the other. And the verse implies a continuing process as well because it says that they will not continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. This is talking about the fact that as a born again believer in the kingdom of God, I nonetheless struggle with sin, but I will not live in sin. It will not be the thing that dominates me if I have truly been born again. I've been translated into the kingdom of God and of his son. And there's power that goes along with that. There's a change of nature, as we talked about, that goes along with that. And so there's a change in behavior. And so we see that. And why is that so? Why can you not do that? Well, because God's seed remains in him. We've been changed. So we see this continuing process indicated as well. And then we've looked at these verses before, but John 3, 3, 5, again, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again, and no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. And then John 6, 44 and 65, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We indicated before that word draws there is not just wooing and sort of enticing, but it's reaching out and grabbing and bringing. And no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. So as I said, we've discussed these before and we'll get to this topic again later. For right now, we don't want to dive into it. We'll just make the the assertion that regeneration precedes faith which I think, to be honest, is so abundantly clear from all of the scriptures we've already looked at. You were dead. Dead people don't rise up and get born again on their own. That's not something you do. So when you put all the scriptures together, it's really a very, very clear teaching that regeneration precedes faith, but we'll get to that on the chapter on regeneration. So what about faith and repentance? Why does Murray put them together? Well, he puts them together because they're the flip sides of the, they're the opposite sides of the same coin, in a sense. The Greek verb that's translated repent is metanoeo, which literally means to think differently or to think afterwards. In other words, to change your mind after considering what you've been doing or how you've been doing something. So it's really a change. It's turning from one thing to another. You can say that repent means, as has been frequently said, to turn away from sin and turn to God which requires saving faith. So repentance, first and foremost, is a turning away from one thing, but to something else, and that turning to something else entails faith. So it's repentance away from the one thing, and then faith in Christ. They are the flip side of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. They go together perfectly. So we can see that these go together also from the definitions given in the Westminster Shorter Catechism again. So what is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and trust on him alone for our salvation as he has offered to us in the gospel. Well, what does that mean? It means offered to us in the gospel. What does the gospel say? Repent and believe. So it's not stated there, but repentance and faith go hand in hand. You see it in the other answer as well. What is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it to God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Well, so we're turning away from something, with grief and hatred even, but we're turning away from our sin unto God. And what's this full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience? That's faith. So again, you see the repentance and the faith go hand in hand. These things cannot be separated, and so Murray treats them as one event, if you will. And so we'll move on here. In John 1.12, we read, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now this establishes that we receive him, which means we must have been told about him, so there was a call that preceded that, And we believe, which means we have exercised faith, so repentance and faith, before we have the right to become children of God. In other words, to be adopted. So you clearly see here that you have calling, and then you have faith and repentance, and then you have adoption. It doesn't specifically speak about justification or regeneration here, but it puts the others in order. And we can move on to Ephesians 1, 
13 and 14, you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, again, calling here, the gospel of your salvation, having believed faith and repentance, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Now, we're not going to get into the fullness of what is meant here by being marked in him with a seal, but the Spirit dwells in and guides God's children, we're told, for example, in Romans 8, verses 14 to 16. So hearing and believing precede adoption because this being marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit is a sign of being a child of God. It's, again, a sign of being in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of his Son. And so clearly, again, we see some order to these things. And then I've got several verses here. Um, Romans 1.17 says, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Romans 3.22 says this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 3.26 says he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And then Romans 3.28 says we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. So you look at these verses and there are some others here you could look at Romans 3.30 5, one, Galatians 2.16, 3.24, and Philippians 3.9 as examples. And you see that we are saved by faith, or we're saved through faith, or by having faith. There's different ways in which the scripture put it, but there's a clear message being given here. The conclusion, as Murray states it, is this. Faith is presupposed in justification. It is the precondition of justification. It is God's appointed instrument through which he dispenses this grace. And in addition, faith is connected with calling because it is the proper response to the call. For example, from Romans 10, 14, how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear unless someone comes and preaches to them? And that is certainly prior to justification. Therefore, faith is prior to justification. Justification is a forensic declaration of God, as we'll see, where he declares us just, and on what basis does he declare us just? Not because I am just, that's the Roman Catholic view. That's analytic justification, or analytic righteousness is the word that the theologians use, which means that God will analyze me and find me to be righteous. If I'm not that way on the day I die, I go to purgatory until I am that way. But the Reformed view is synthetic righteousness, that there's something that's outside of me that has been given to me, it has been imputed. We've seen 2 Corinthians 5.21 a number of times here, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's the idea here, that I'm not righteous, but God declares me to be righteous because he has imputed my sins into Christ's account and he has imputed Christ's righteousness into my account. When he looks at me, he sees me clothed in Jesus Christ. He sees me in Christ. It is in Christ that we were elected. It is in Christ we have been saved. We are in Christ. We have to understand the, the importance of that, the significance of that. Yes, we're changed. That has to be true. If it's not true, you're not really in Christ. Our nature is changed. But our nature is not so changed that I somehow on my own deserve to come into God's presence. I mean, friends, think about that for a minute. Just look at your own life, look at your own heart, and ask yourself, do I deserve to be in heaven? If heaven is a perfect place, and it is, then I'd better not go there as I am, because if I go there, I'm going to screw it up for sure. It's not going to be perfect anymore at all. All right? So we have to understand the importance of this, that we are in Jesus Christ. And so faith is prior to justification. The only way God can declare me to be just this forensic judicial declaration on his behalf, on his part, I'm sorry, is that I am in Christ. And he sees me that way, not as I am in myself. All right, application must come after, just, or adoption, I'm sorry, must come after justification, as Murray notes. You could not think of one being adopted into the family of God without first of all being accepted by God and made an heir of eternal life. You can't be in the family if you aren't first a child. So, and being a child means you have to have been changed in some way, shape, or form, and you have to have been declared just by God. 
And Murray explains why he places sanctification after adoption. This is one of the places where you could certainly change the order. But he says sanctification is a process that begins, we might say, in regeneration, finds its basis in justification, and derives its energizing grace from the union with Christ, which is affected in effectual calling. Being a continuous process rather than a momentary act like calling, regeneration, justification, and adoption, it is proper that it should be placed after adoption in the order of application. I'll pick one little tiny bone with Murray here. Um, <clears throat> he says this is a continuous process rather than a momentary act. I don't think by that he meant that the calling, you know, the first time you hear the gospel is certainly a momentary act. But as we saw the, the definition from the Westminster Shorter Catechism about what's involved in effectual calling, right? And you have to be convinced of your sin and misery. You have to be enlightened in the knowledge of God. You have to be uh, changed in your will and enabled to embrace Christ and so on. That's a process, and that takes time for most people. It doesn't have to. God can save somebody instantly, but that's not the normal way. Most of us hear the gospel, and then we struggle with it a little bit. Then we hear more things, and other things happen. So I don't think he meant by this that it's an instantaneous event. So maybe he shouldn't have said momentary act and then put calling in that list. But regeneration certainly is a momentary act of God. There's no indication in Scripture that he takes time to do this. He causes us to be born again, and then we respond to the call. That may take time. We don't know. Um, and justification, of course, is an instantaneous act of God because it's a forensic declaration, and so is adoption. But the calling, I don't know that I would have put in that list. And then he notes that perseverance is the concomitant and complement of the sanctifying process and might conveniently be placed either before or after sanctification. So what is he saying here? He's saying the idea that we're going to persevere is inherent in the idea of the sanctifying process because it's God's work. As Paul wrote, I am confident of this, what? That you will persevere because you're a wonderful person? No, that God will cause you to persevere. He will continue to work in you what he has begun and bring it to completion. So union with Christ, the final one here before glorification, is not really a step in the process at all, but underlies every step. So therefore, its, it's location in this list is really somewhat arbitrary. You could have put it first almost. Um, again, we are, a, we are seen by God in all eternity when he chose us. What does it say? You are chosen in Christ. So you, you could have put this almost anywhere. And we'll get there when we deal with that chapter on union with Christ. It's a marvelous doctrine, the mother of all doctrines, Murray calls it. Glorification is last in Romans 8.30, that list that we saw, and clearly cannot come before a person has persevered and been sanctified, no matter how short that process may be for a given person. Think about the thief on the cross. You know, the thief on the cross started off, we're told in one of the chapters in the Gospels, that he was berating Christ just like the other thief. Both thieves were berating him. Then one of them somehow miraculously came to an understanding of who Jesus Christ was and who he was and that he needed this Savior. And he cried out to God for mercy. And what did Christ say? Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, how much sanctification did that thief get to go through? It was all on the cross, folks. <laughs> okay, but did he have any good works? Yeah, what did he do? He rebuked the other thief, didn't he? So at the very least, he stood up and, you know, he didn't stand up, he was hanging there, but, but he stood up for, <laughs> in the metaphorical sense, Jesus Christ and rebuked this other thief. So he was sanctified, perhaps not as well as the Apostle Paul. <laughs> but that's not important. This is all in God's plan. But whatever that process is, glorification must be the final step. Whatever God has ordained for each one of us in terms of the trials we must go through, and how much we must learn about mortifying our own flesh and, and walking in this new life that God has given us and so forth. At the end of the day, none of us have arrived, as the Apostle Paul wrote. He did not consider himself to have arrived. But when God decides it's time, we have arrived. <laughs> and he will perfect us and bring us into his presence. Praise God. So now we are ready to start chapter 2 of, of the application of redemption. So at the end of the parable of the wedding banquet, and this is on effectual calling, at the end of the parable of the wedding banquet, when the one guest was not wearing proper clothing and, and was thrown out, what does the king say? He says, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. 
In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. That's not the calling that Murray's going to address in this chapter. And so there is a calling that is a general call that goes out to all people, but is not efficacious for their salvation. And then there is a calling that is efficacious to bring someone to salvation. And Murray points out, it is very striking that in the New Testament, the terms for calling, when used specifically with reference to salvation, are almost uniformly applied not to the universal call of the gospel, but to the call that ushers men into a state of salvation and is therefore effectual. So this chapter is not on the general call of God. This chapter is on the effectual call of God, which we read the Westminster Shorter Catechism answer on, and it accomplishes things. It changes us. It's part and parcel of God's causing us to be born again. We don't know the exact process there. The Bible doesn't tell us that, and that's a mystery we can't really plumb the depths of. But somehow, through this effectual call and the work of God's Holy Spirit, we're changed, and we become new creatures, new beings. So therefore, this chapter deals specifically with the effectual call of God, and we will look at the nature of that call next week. We'll get into that chapter in detail. So what application should we draw from this? Well, we should take great comfort in the fact that our salvation is secure in the hands of God. It doesn't depend on me. It does in the sense that there are things I need to be doing. If I'm not doing them, I'm not truly born again. But ultimately, it does not depend on me. It's not like if I fall down tomorrow and commit some horrible sin, my salvation is gone. There is no such thing as a mortal sin. All sin is mortal, in a sense, but God has taken care of all of it in Christ. So I don't need to worry about that. What a glorious and wonderful freedom that gives me. Not that I should be free to sin, but that I'm free from this worry, this concern about, well, maybe tomorrow I'm going to mess it up. You know, maybe I should just go die today so that won't happen. <laughs> well, that would be a sin, too, if I caused that, wouldn't it? So that would be a problem. You know, of course, the classic example of this biblically is, is King David. Here was a man after God's own heart, and yet the scripture records for us the fact that this man, as king, so it makes it even worse, but as king, at the spring, in the springtime when the kings go off to war, he wasn't off at war. Joab was off leading the troops. And what was he doing? Wandering around on the top of his palace in the middle of the day. He had just gotten up. He was being lazy. He looked down and he saw Bathsheba. He coveted her. He took her. He brought her into himself. He committed adultery with her. And then he tried to cover it up by bringing her husband, right? And then that didn't work very well, so he killed him or had him killed. So this man committed adultery and he committed murder and he didn't repent of it immediately. He went on for a while. And then the prophet Nathan comes to him finally and tells him that parable about the guy, you know, putting the, you know, taking the sheep from this man who only had one. And then he says, you are the man. And then we see David's great deep repentance. But through all of that, he was a child of God. And so in that, we should take great comfort. And so let's look at Romans 8, 30 and 31 again. We'll add 31 to it this time. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. It will happen. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer is many can be against us, but they won't succeed. Therefore, we should serve God with fear and confidence, not fearing the world. As Christ said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So, it's an amazing truth, but it's the fear of God that sets us free from the fear of men and the world. And as true Christians, we should take this great comfort in God's having accomplished this and that he will do all that he has promised to do. And because of that, we should then go out boldly and proclaim the gospel and obey God and live for him and not worry about what men might do to us. They can kill the body. That's all they can do. That just ushers me into glory. So let's come to get, well, for next time, you should review chapter 2, which you were supposed to read for today, but we didn't get very far into it. So review that and then read chapter 3. It's fairly short also. Let's uh, join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this your day. We thank you for this glorious redemption that you have accomplished and you have applied. Lord, we pray for any here 
in whom you may not yet have applied that redemption, Lord. We pray that you would have mercy and you would cause them to cry out to God in repentance and faith. Lord, we ask your blessing on this day, O God, as we come together to hear your word and to worship you. May you be pleased and may you be glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.